Commander Vladislav Gruder no longer speaks with his native Polish accent. Brought to this country by his parents in 1939, he was rapidly absorbed into North Country life and at the age of 17 became a professional footballer. After an effective, if undistinguished, career as player and coach, he entered that most precarious of professions, football management, and in 1969 became manager of Fulchester Rovers. Rovers were at that time anchored firmly in the bottom half of the third division, but two seasons later, in May 1971, the team became champions of that division and were promoted to the second. But life in the higher echelons was short-lived. A mediocre season, followed by a disastrous one, saw the team return to the third division in 1973. Gruder paid the now familiar penalty, and his contract was not renewed. But he was far from finished. A month after his dismissal, the football press resounded with the news that criminal charges had been laid against three Rovers players. Bernard Skelhorn, James McIver, and Peter Appledean were charged with conspiring together to bring about the termination of Gruder's employment as manager of Fulchester Rovers by failing to perform their own contracts with the club. Their trial at the Fulchester Crown Court has just begun. your name and where do you live? Uh, my name is Alexander Vladislav Gruder and I live at the uh, Northcliffe Private Hotel, Fulchester. As a paying guest? As, as a paying guest, yes. I, I've had a room there for two years. I take it you're not married? No. No, I'm not married. Now, Mr. Gruder, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to give the court a brief resume of your life since coming to this country. Yes, Mr. Lotterby, I am as anxious as you are to be spared autobiographical detail, but my instinct tells me that a little insight in that direction might help us in this case. So long, Miss Lewis, as your witness does not spend too long on his early life. Thank you, my lord. Mr. Gruder, as I said, a brief resume. Uh, I came to this country in 1939 with my mother and father. I was eight years old. Uh, my father had been a footballer in Poland, an amateur. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a diamond cutter by profession, and we had a, a good life. But uh, my mother was uh, Jewish, and he decided we should leave and come to England. We settled in Lancashire, and both my mother and father worked in a mill in Haywood. I went to the local school until I was uh, 15. And after school? Uh, I took one or two odd jobs. I was apprenticed in engineering works for about a year, but uh, football, football was in my blood, I suppose. And in 1948, I had a successful trial with Bury, and I signed professional well, forms for Is all them. this really relevant? Could we make more rapid strides to the present time, do you think, Miss Lewis? We're almost there, my lord. As brief as possible, please. Yes, sir. I also played for Stockport County and Blackburn Rovers. And at the end of my playing career, I took up coaching. I'd already taken a coaching diploma. And from that, I, I moved into management. And when did you join Fulchester Rovers? Uh, in June 1969. Would you give the court details of the contract you signed at that time? Ah, yes, it was for four years, expiring at the end of the 72-73 season. Uh, my basic starting wage was 2,800, with a rise of 200 pounds every year. Of course, there were big bonuses for cup runs, promotions, and that sort of thing. What were your top earnings during this period? Uh, we were promoted to the second division in 1971, and I earned oh, almost uh, 4,000 pounds. I see. And supposing the team had stayed in the second division, what might you have been expected to earn in a moderately successful season? Oh, a lot more. I should think between uh, five and a half and six thousand. Uh, basic. You see, Your Honour, uh, with the economic situation as it is, yes, all Mr. salaries... We do all understand we have all been torn upon the rack of inflation. Now, Miss Lewis, I must ask you not to make too ready assumption of an understanding of football matters. I realise that to ma many people in this country, football is an open book, but to many others, it is a total secret. Perhaps the jury is so divided. I mean, can you be sure, for example, that we all know what the second division is? If I may explain, my lord. The English Football League is divided into 92 clubs, 22 in each of the first and second division, 24 in each of the third and fourth. At the end of each season, based on a point system, the least successful clubs are relegated and the most successful clubs are promoted to a higher division. Now, Mr. Gruder, you have told us that in May 1971, Fulchester Rovers were promoted to the second division. How long did the team stay there? Uh, for two seasons. Uh, the first year we did uh, reasonably well, finished in eighth place. The uh, next year we finished in bottom place. And what happened then? 
Well, I was called in front of the board of directors and told that my contract wouldn't be renewed. Oh, did they give you any reason for this? Uh, yes, Mr. Gross told me. Mr. Gross? He's the chairman. He told me that uh, I'd been given the money I asked for to buy the players, but in spite of that, I couldn't keep the club out of the second division, and they uh, thought it was time to make a change. Did this surprise you? No, I'd been told when I joined the club that only one thing counted. That was success. And you were happy to accept your contract under those terms? <laughs> you wouldn't become a manager if you didn't. It's that sort of job. Oh, it's... It's fair enough. It's fair enough. You had no quarrel with the board's decision? No, no, not with the board, no. As far as they were concerned, I'd failed. But they didn't know the truth, no more than anybody else. And what was the truth, Mr. Gruder? Well, let me put it this way. Had I been sacked because of some mistake, oh, Lord, I'd I think it should be pointed out that Mr. Gruder, as I understand it, was not sacked. His contract expired and was not renewed. There is a distinction. Is that so, Mr. Is? Yes, my lord. I'm sure my witness understands the distinction. Mr. Gruder, if I may ask you again, what was the truth? Well, what I was going to say was, if my contract wasn't renewed because of some mistake I'd made, or if I hadn't been managing the team well enough, I wouldn't have had any comeback. But that was not the case. No. So, what you are saying is that the club's lack of success was directly due to the actions of others. Is he, my lord? Yes, I share your puzzlement, <laughs> Mr. Lotterby, but at the same time, I must confess, I find your objection academic. I mean, if he didn't say that, There'd be little point in us being gathered here today. However, though academic, your objection is valid. Miss Lewis, please do not lead. Let your witness speak for himself. Yes, my lord. Let me ask you a straightforward question, Mr. Gruder. Fulchester Rovers were relegated to the third division in May 1973. Why? Because three of my first team squad consistently played well below their capabilities in more than half the league matches last season. And are those three men in court today? Yes, they are. Who are they? Scalon, MacIver, and Appledeen. Can you give any illustration of the bad play you observed? Ah, uh, yes, well, uh, you get to know players. You get to know right away when something's wrong. I mean, if you know a player's got a heart as big as a lion and suddenly starts chickening out of 50-50 balls, you know something funny's going yeah. on. Could you explain that remark? Chickening out of what? Oh, well, I mean, uh, not fighting for the ball. When two players have got an equal chance of getting the ball, that's a 50-50 ball. And you want your man to win it every time. And when a man who normally wins it keeps losing it, well, you, you start thinking things. I see. Thank you. Mr. Gruder, this uh, player with the heart as big as a lion who chickened out of 50-50 balls, rather a mixed metaphor, but thanks to his lordship, I'm sure we now all understand it. Is this a hypothetical case, or are you referring to a particular player? I was describing Jim McIver. And what is McIver's position on the field? Uh, he's a striker. He wears a number nine shirt. And how would you... Ex <coughs> please, for the benefit of the jury, would you explain what the role of a striker is? Uh, yes, he's there to score goals and lay them on for other players. Uh, a striker, he's, he's an attacker. What was McIver's record with the club up to last season? Oh, it was very good. He joined the club the year before I did and he averaged 22 league goals a season, up to last year. And that's good? Well, they don't come much better. Not nowadays. And what happened to McIver last season? He scored four goals in the first seven matches, and for the rest of the season, that's another 35 games, he scored six. And two of those were penalties. Disappointing, to say the least. I'd call it criminal. Well, I don't think we can complain about the word criminal, Mr. Lotterby. Surely it was used in its idiomatic sense. Um, contemptible, shall we say, rather than illegal. Oh, I agree entirely, my lord. I wasn't objecting to the use of the word criminal, uh, but to the implication that none of us can have off days without it being either contemptible or illegal. We all of us at times fail to do our jobs as well as we might. That applies to us all. Yes, I'm making no comment, Mr. Lotterbeer. Continue, please. I was about to add, my lord, that uh, with the tremendous pressures that there are today on professional footballers, inconsistencies of performance are bound to occur. Thank you. Mr. Gruder, would you describe McIver's performance last season as normal, an off period? No. Why not? All players go through bad spells, but in my experience, there's always a good reason for it. Injury, lack of training, family troubles. None of these apply to McIver. Are you sure of that? Well, I'd have known about any injury, or if he wasn't training, and he never said anything about domestic troubles, and they're encouraged to. Now, let us move on to Skelhorn and Appledean. Your suggestion is that neither of these men gave of their best during the majority of league matches played last season. That is correct. Tell us about Skelhorn. Uh, he was a midfield player, number four. It was his job to pick up the ball in the middle of the park, the, the field, that is, 
and link up with the strikers and then put the ball through for them to collect and score. That's putting it in its simplest terms. And as midfield players go, how was Skelhorn? Good. Archie is best, very good in my opinion. He should have played for England. But last season he was not at his best. No. No, no he started to lose it about the same time as Mackay were about uh, seven or eight matches in. How did this manifest itself? How could you tell he was losing it, as you put it? Well, in my opinion, Sc Scalon was one of the best tacklers in the game. He was, he was clean, because he was clever. He didn't need to be dirty. He could time a tackle to the right split second, come away with the ball and put it where he wanted. And then suddenly, it all went. He began to look clumsy, which he never was. He gave away free kicks. He gave away 13 one match. That was more than his total for the previous season. And his passing went... Seven out of ten went to the other side. And this went on for most of the season? Oh, same. some games were worse than others. We were losing matches. We should have won. Drawing teams, we should have... We should have murdered. And you can't do that and stay off the bottom. And what about Appledean? Oh, uh, Appledean was cleverer than the other two. He wasn't so easy to spot, but it was there. He was fast. Very fast. And then suddenly, again about the same time of the season, he started failing to reach passes you could have sworn he should have made. And he put the odd corner behind, out of play, that is, which is something he never did. He didn't make as many mistakes as the other players, but, oh, he timed them better. If we were playing a crucial match, and there's a lot of them when you're near the bottom, and it looked as if we might be getting on top, he'd pull something shady out of the bag. And he's a bit of a pied piper. Whatever he did, good or bad, seemed to have a sort of general effect on the team. Thank you. Now, Mr. Gruder, when Fulchester Rovers dispensed with your services, did you try to obtain another position as a football manager? Ah, yes. With no success? No. What is your present employment and salary? Uh, I'm the manager of a small do-it-yourself supermarket in the Churchill Precinct, and I earn uh, £1,800 a year. And as you've already told us, had you still been the manager of a second division club, you might have expected to earn between six and £7,000 a year. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Gruder. And your view is, is it, Mr. Gruder, that this reduction in earnings and the fact that you are no longer doing the job you love are directly attributable to the actions of the accused? <coughs> yes, that's, that's correct. Mm. Well, didn't it ever occur to you that these three players playing, as you believe, badly over the same period might be no more than coincidence? No. So what conclusions did you reach, Mr. Gruder? They planned it. They got together and worked out how to get rid of me. Why? Because they didn't like the way I ran the club. They didn't like the discipline I imposed because they were good footballers but rotten men. Mr. Gruder, when you were called before the board and told that your contract was not to be renewed, did you then make this accusation you're making here today? Ah, yes, I did. To the board, you mean? That's right. Yes, I did. And what was their reaction? Well, they didn't exactly call me a liar, but I could see they didn't believe me. I didn't really expect them to, to tell the truth. Well, that's what you're here for, Mr. Gruder, to tell the truth. Now, why didn't you expect the board to believe you? I had no proof. Not then. You say you had no proof at that time. Your belief then was based on instinct. Ah, yes. Mr. Gruder, much of these proceedings appears to revolve around your judgment. You've told his lordship that you are able to make instinctive judgments on the quality of play. And from what you've told my learned friend, it would appear that you are equally adept at judging the quality of men. Are you prepared to stand by your judgment, uh, not only when your career depends upon it, but also the freedom of three men? Yes, I do. Well, suppose for a moment that the three errant members of your club were, in your judgment, not only good footballers, but also good men. Would you have reached the same conclusions uh, that a conspiracy was afoot? No, of course not. No, of course not. So what you are, in fact, saying is that your suspicions were based not merely on what you knew of the footballing abilities of the accused, but on what you knew of their characters. Yes. Tell me, Mr. Gruder, what do you look for in a footballer? Ability to play football. Ability to live a clean, honest life. Ability to take discipline and to work hard. And apart from the ability to play football, these were virtues sadly lacking from the characters of the accused? In my opinion, yes. Then I suggest to you, Mr. Gruder, that your judgment is not as faultless as you would have us believe. Is it not true that you sign two of the accused yourself? Yeah, yes, it is, but... Uh... Well, simply answer the question, Mr. Gruder. Did you or did you not sign Skillhorn and Appledean? I did. You are Polish, are you not? No, 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 I'm British. I was naturalised with my parents. If I hadn't been naturalised, I wouldn't have been able to play football for an English league club. No, of course, forgive me. You are Polish by extraction and by birth. Ah, uh, yes. I've always believed the Poles are a particularly proud people, unwilling to accept defeat. Would you agree with that? 
Well, 11 of them are pretty unwilling at Wembley in the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can't speak for every poll. If you're talking about me personally, I don't happily accept defeat. I, I never have. Or failure? They're the same thing in my book. So it's safe to say that if failure were imminent, you would do everything in your power to dissociate yourself from that failure? No. No? No, it wouldn't be safe to say that. You're now saying you would accept defeat? No, I'm not. I said I didn't accept defeat happily. But if I failed and it was my fault, I'd accept that failure. Not happily, but I'd accept it. I see. That is your judgment of yourself. Ah, uh, yes. And is it as valued as your judgment of others? That judgment which led you to choose, in your own words, rotten men? Now, that's something else I didn't say. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say I chose them. I said I signed them, which I did, but I didn't do the choosing. The board of directors did the choosing. Are you seriously suggesting you had no say in the matter? Oh, well, that's the truth. When I was told they wanted to sign, I said oh, to the chairman... Oh, thank you, Mr. No monologues, please. Now, the season finished for Fortress Rovers on April the 28th of last year, <laughs> although it was determined that the club would be relegated two weeks earlier. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were called in front of the board on Tuesday, May the 1st, and told that your contract would not be renewed. That's correct. Now, you've told my learned friend at great length that you uh, noticed the deterioration in the play of the three accused fairly early in the season. Now, at what point did you decide that this was not coincidence, but a dastardly plot? Oh, I, I became pretty sure they were in it together just after the, uh, the Christmas games. And whom had you told about it prior to telling the board on May the 1st? No one. No one? Well, are you telling this court that you kept this, uh, this uh, important discovery to yourself for, what, four months? I told no one. Speak up, please. I said I told no one. But why not, Mr. Gruder? Because I couldn't be sure it would go no further. It doesn't take much to knock a club off its stride, particularly when it's coming from the manager. Everybody's watching him. Players, the board, the supporters, the press. And there was still a chance we could avoid relegation. I, I didn't want to lose that chance. Surely there were other steps you could have taken, like dropping the players in question. I did. I dropped scale on once and Appleding twice. Well, it doesn't sound very drastic. It didn't have the required effect. The replacements didn't play well either. Oh, you're suggesting that these replacements were also part of this plot to bring you down? No, no, I'm not. Oh, they were allowed to uh, fall short of perfection without your becoming suspicious, unlike the accused. I see. Mr. Grutter, the charge against the accused is, is it not, that they conspire together to terminate your employment by failing to perform their own contract of service? That is correct. And conspiracy is a criminal offence, but... Uh, Failing to win a 50-50 ball, losing one's ability to pass, or putting the odd corner behind, are these criminal offences? No. No, however strongly certain elements on the terraces might feel they should be. Mr. Gruder, have you yourself ever been present at any activity which would allow you to support this charge of conspiracy? No. No, you delayed airing your suspicions not to save the club because at the time you had no such suspicions. But realising that uh, you were faced with the loss of a profitable job due entirely to your own failure, you looked around for a scapegoat and you picked on the three accused. That isn't true. Mr. Grudo, what do you think is likely to happen to you if the accused are found not guilty of the charges laid against them? I don't know. Don't you, Mr. Grudo? Well, do you think it likely that you will ever be offered a job in football management? Learn. Oh, come now, Mr. Good. It's a simple question. Do you consider it likely that under those circumstances you will ever be offered a job in football management? Possibly not. And how would that affect you? I'd, um, I'd be disappointed. You'd be disappointed. Just disappointed. Do you expect the court to believe that that would be the extent of your feelings? Well, I suggest to you, Mr. Gruder, that you would be devastated. And I further suggest, and this is borne out by the way in which you've given your evidence, that football is your life and that you are, want desperately to return to it. And like all desperate men, you are willing, amongst other things, to lie. That is not true. Mr. Gruder, you told my learned friend that although you admitted signing some of the players, you did not necessarily choose them. Uh, would you explain? Yes, well, um, it was one of my duties to draw up contracts with the club solicitor and be present when the players signed. Uh, generally, the directors prefer to keep out of the picture. I drew up a statement for the press and I answered their questions if there were any. You could say that I, I represented the club at such times. So it appeared as though you yourself were employing these new players. Not only employing them, but happy to do so. Oh yes, I, I always smile for the photographers. But you were not necessarily so happy with the events leading up to the signings. Ah, uh, no, no. No, more often than not, uh, directors have a pretty fair idea of what makes a footballer, but uh, they also have the money, which counts. But there are times when they make mistakes, and I thought they made a mistake with both uh, Scalehorn and Appledean. You see, directors don't always have a good idea of the player's background, his character. All they know is what they see on the field. And it's a very, uh, very autocratic business, is this football. There's a lot of the us and them. But managers know players. 
and they're the fellows I talked to. What had you heard about Skelhorn and Appledean? Oh, Skelhorn had been around a lot. I think we were his sixth club. You can't very well ask the manager who wants to sell him what he's like, but there are plenty of others, and they all said the same thing. He's a big head. Good footballer, but a big head. And if you want to build up a team that wants to play with each other, you don't want the Barney Skelhorns of this world. Same with Appledean. He was a troublemaker. He wanted to change football. He wanted the players to rule the game. Now, I'm not saying that professional football is perfect, but you change things gradually, not the way you wanted to do it. He was an anarchist. And you conveyed your feelings about these players to the board when it was suggested they should be bought? Yes, I did. But apparently the members of the board were not impressed. Not enough. I think Mr. Gross was on my side, the late chairman, but Mr. Martindale, the present chairman, and two of the others voted for buying, so, so that was it. Finally, Mr. Gruder, my learned friend has suggested that you have lied to this court. Have you lied? No. No, I haven't. Thank you, Mr. Gruder. No further questions? Very well, Mr. Magru Mr. Gruder. You may go. go. I call Margaret Skelhorn. Margaret Skelhorn, please. Would you tell the court your name and address, please? Margaret, my full name? Please. Margaret Mary Skelhorn, 24 Rutherford Gardens, Fulchester. What is your marital st status, Mrs. Skelhorn? I'm divorced. Is your ex-husband in court? Yes. Would you point him out to us? He is Bernard Skelhorn, one of the accused. Is that correct? Yes. You must speak up, please. The jury must be able to hear you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. How long have you been divorced? Um, it was finalised in December, December 1972. I understand you have children. Yes, two. Uh, Diana, she's six, and Gary's four. I see. Who was granted custody of the children at the time of the divorce? Well, I was, but it was agreed that my, my ex-husband could see them at least one day every month. And you kept to this agreement? Oh, yes. I used to take them up there every fourth Sunday. I kept the house, you see, and he got one of those service flats at Mountjoy. We never stayed the whole day. He never seemed to want them the old day. We get up there about 10 o'clock, like I said, and we were nearly always home in time for our dinner. Were you on good terms with your ex-husband, Mrs. Skelhorn? Oh, no. But there was no point of being awkward about it. I'd talk to him, you know, and he'd talk to me. But if it hadn't been for the children, I wouldn't have gone near him. The case of the Queen against Appledean, MacIver and Skelhorn will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court. In 1973, Fulchester Rovers were relegated from the second to the third division. As a result, the club did not renew the contract of its Polish-born manager, Alexander Gruder. Two months later, the football world was shocked by the news that three of Rovers' first-team players, Barney Skelhorn, Jim McIver and Peter Appledean, had been charged with conspiring together to bring about the termination of Gruder's employment as Fulchester manager by failing to perform their own contracts with the club. Mr. Gruder and his evidence alleged that all three men had played well below their capabilities for most of the season. He accused them of deliberately and maliciously plotting his downfall. Mr. Lotterby, counsel for the defendants, suggested in cross-examination that this action on Mr. Gruder's part was a deliberate attempt to save face, to shift the blame for failure, and to fight his way out of the wilderness and back into football. Mrs. Skelhorn, ex-wife of one of the accused, is now in the witness box. Now, Mrs. Skelhorn, I'd like you to uh, cast your mind back, if you can, to Sunday, January the 21st, 1973. Did you take your children to see your ex-husband on that day? 
Yes, I did. I got it there about 10 o'clock as usual. And what did you find there? Well, the place was in a tip. There were breakfast pots all over the table, <clears throat> and it stunk to high heaven of tobacco smoke. Who was there? My, my ex-husband, Peter Appledean and Jim McIver. Oh, they were known to you already, <clears throat> McIver and Appledean? Oh, yes. And what were they doing when you arrived there? Well, they, they didn't seem to be doing anything special. They looked as if they'd been sitting around talking. Oh, and they'd started drinking. Drinking? Vodka. Barney always drank vodka. He read somewhere you couldn't smell it on your breath. Uh, taking it from <clears> this <throat> point, would you tell the court what happened on the occasion of this visit? Uh, yes. Um, Barney asked me if I'd like a drink, and I said I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee, so he said I could make one for all of them while I were at it. I see. Go on. Well, I went into the kitchen and started rooting around for cups and things, and as soon as my back was turned, they started talking again, and it sounded as if they were carrying on with what they'd been talking about before. You could hear them quite clearly, could you? <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, would you explain to the court exactly how? Well, there wasn't a door as such on the kitchen, not a proper one. There was just one of these things like they have in Western, so every word they said... Um, excuse me <coughs> interrupting, but what are these things they have in Western? Well, they're, they're like half doors with a, with a big gap at the top and a small gap at the bottom. And they're, they're like swing. Ah, yes. Normally mm. found in saloons, my lord. So I believe. And you were able to hear quite plainly what the accused was saying? Oh, yes, my lord. And can you remember what was said? Well, I can remember the gist of it. Um, Peter Appledean was doing most of the talking. And he said how oh, they'd have to be careful when they played United on Saturday in case they made it too obvious, and how United weren't having a very good time at the moment, and how they'd have to help him along. And then, oh yes, then he said, it would be a good idea if Jim upended one of their players in the box. And what does that mean precisely, Mrs. Skelhorn? It means if he tripped one of their players in the penalty area. And what would the result of that be? Well, the other side would get a penalty, and they score more often than not from penalties. I see. Thank you. Did you hear anything else? Uh, yes, Barney said something. He said, we'd better be careful or we'll not only get rid of our friend, but we'll end up back amongst the rags. And then Peter said, yes, we don't want to be too good. And Jim said, you mean too bad, and they all laughed. Then I shouted in from the kitchen, and I think they must have realised that if they could hear me, I could hear them. Anyway, they were quiet enough after that. Did they say anything to you? Did they try to find out if you had heard? No, nothing, but they weren't exactly nervous. Well, yes, I, I suppose you could say nervous. They never said out more about it. How long were you there? Oh, I was there a couple of hours. We all had this cup of coffee, and kids had some orange juice, and Barney and the other two, they played with Gary for a bit. Diana, she sat with me. She didn't like going much. There wasn't all that much there for her. Then about 12 o'clock, we all went home. Were the accused still there when you left? Oh, yes, all three of them. And you took the children to see your ex-husband at regular intervals since then? Yes. Well, up till a couple of months ago, my mother started taking them then. I, I haven't seen my ex-husband since then. Till today. On the occasions when you did go, did you hear any more conversations along the lines you've already described? Oh, no, not about that. He was nearly always by himself. <laughs> except once when he was with Peter Appledean, but they never said anything. Not about that. Now, Mrs. Skelhorn, I want you to listen carefully to my question, and I want your reply to be equally careful. During the period between your divorce becoming absolute and the present day, did you observe anything which indicated what your ex-husband felt towards Mr. Gruder? Oh, yes, there was one time. It was a Friday night sometime in March. I was at the Lido Club with a girlfriend, and at about 11 o'clock, in walks Barney and the other two with a crowd of girls. I remember telling my girlfriend at the time they'd get into trouble, because Mr. Gruder likes the players in bed half past ten night before a match. Still, it weren't any of my business anymore, and they, they were quiet enough. And then about oh, half past eleven, in walks Mr. Gruder with Mr. Thomasin. He's the trainer. They walked straight up to the table where Barney and the other two were sitting, and they told him to go. You could hear this? Well, no, I couldn't hear it, but he pointed to the door. It was quite obvious. And what happened then? They didn't go. They just sat there. You could tell Mr. Gruder was trying to keep it quiet, but a row broke out. I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying, but I heard Jim McIver shout sod off once. Mostly it was a sort of a, a blur, though. Anyway, after about ten minutes argy-bargy, they all got up and left. Skelhorn, Appledean and McIver? Yes. How did they look when they left? Did they take it well? They did not. They looked black as thunder. And that's the only occasion of this nature you can recall? 
Oh, there were plenty of times before then Mrs. When... Skelhorn, we are only interested in what you saw and heard after you ceased to be married to the accused Bernard Skelhorn. Now, is that clear? Yes, my lord. Miss Lewis, you must phrase your questions carefully. As I am sure you are aware, when we are imprecise with this witness, we are treading on dangerous ground. Yes, my lord. In fact, I have no further questions. Uh, Mrs. Skelhorn, when you overheard your ex-husband and the other two plotting, what did you do? Nothing. Why not? Well, it didn't sink in at the time. Oh, I see. Well, when did you first tell someone about it? Well, I can't remember the day exactly. It was uh, beginning of May, I think, a Tuesday. Anyway, the phone rang at nine, at night that was, and it was Doreen Pulitzer. That's Mick Pulitzer's wife. Uh, he's the captain of Fulchester Rovers. Anyway, she said that Mr. Groder had been sacked, and had I heard, and I said I hadn't. Was that the word she used, sacked? Yes, I think it was. Yes, I'm sure it was. Did you say anything else? Yes, she said that Mr. Gruder had rung them, her husband that is, as soon as he'd come out of the boardroom. They were very upset. Well, what was your reaction to the news? Well, I was upset too. He was a very nice man, Mr. Gruder, and didn't sound as if he'd had a very fair deal. Well, could you explain that? Why didn't it sound as if he'd had a very fair deal? Well, after I'd spoken to Dorian, I had a few words with Mick, and he said how some of the players had let Mr. Gruder down, and he was very sorry to say that Barney, my ex-husband, was one of them. She, he said he had proof, and he was going round to see him next day. Mm -hmm. I see. Go on. Well, I came off the phone, and I, I made myself a cup of coffee and sat down, and I started thinking. And suddenly, I, I began to remember that Sunday morning at Barney's. And the more I thought about it, the more important it got. So I popped round to my mother's. She lives next door but two, and I asked her if she'd look after the children. And I went straight round to Mr. Gruder's. What time was this? Oh, it would be about ten o'clock time I got there. Ten o'clock? Well, didn't you consider it might be rather late to go to see Mr. Gruder at his hotel room, I take it? Yes, it was at his hotel. I, w I wouldn't normally have gone, except I wanted to get it off my chest. I see. Uh, what did Mr. Gruder say? Well, he, he thanked me for coming, and he, he said, would I repeat what I'd heard, and I said I would, and I left. Mm-hmm. Mr. Skellon, what happened to you on June the 4th, 1973? I don't know. August the 7th? No idea. Well, let's get a little nearer to the present time, shall we? Uh, December the 17th. What did you do on December the 17th? If it helps, it was a Monday. Oh, well, I'd wash, I suppose. You'd wash, you suppose. Mrs. Skelmer, don't you find it odd that you can't remember the events of a day in December, a day in August, a day in June, and yet when my learned friend mentions a Sunday of January the 21st of last year, you not only remembered where you went that day, but practically everything that was said. Oh, I see. Oh, Mrs. Skelhorn, because I don't. Was there something particularly odd about that day? It was Gary's birthday. My son, it was his fourth birthday. I see. Well, that might, uh, that might explain why you remembered going where you did that day, but does it really explain how you came to recall so vividly the conversation between the three accused? I've got a very good memory. Oh, I see. But yet, referring to the telephone call from Mrs. Pollitson, you say, I can't remember the day exactly. It was the beginning of May, and I think it was a Tuesday. And your visit to the nightclub was uh, sometime in March, a uh, Friday night. I'm not very good at dates. Conversations, I can remember. The things people say. Everything people say, or just some things? Oh, not everything. Just important things. Ah, important things. Uh, Mrs. Skelhorn, living as you have done for some years in the world of football, you must have heard many arguments, uh, debates, learned dissertations on the game. Uh, are these all important to you? Oh, no. They bore me to tears. Really? But surely this talk between the three accused, which you say took place on January the 21st, was about football. Oh, not just about football. It was about what they were going to do to Mr. Gruder. Oh, to Mr. Gruder? Mm. Oh, do forgive me, I must have misheard. You see, his name was mentioned on that occasion. Oh, no, his name wasn't mentioned, but they were talking about him. It's obvious now, isn't it? <laughs> Mrs. Skelhorn, are you telling this court that as you stood in a kitchen making coffee on the morning of Sunday, January the 21st, you said to yourself, I am listening to a conversation which will become important on the evening of Tuesday, May the 1st. Is that what you're trying to tell us? No, of course I'm then not. I wish you'd try to tell us something, Mrs. Skelhorn, because on the one hand, you only remember important conversations, and yet on the other hand, you remember an incident which you recall most vividly, mentioning it uh, in these words. Uh, and I'm not remembering them, Mrs. Skelhorn. I've got them written down. And suddenly I began to remember what I'd heard at Barney's that Sunday morning. And the more I thought, the more important it got. It was important in May, but it wasn't important in January, and yet you remembered it. I did remember. Did you, Mrs. Kellogg? Did you? 
Is it not a fact that this alleged conversation only achieved importance on May the 1st? Or would it be truer to say that it was only born on that date because it is a fiction concocted by yourself and Mr. Gruder to support his allegations against the accused? No! Why should I do that? Why indeed? Now, you see, you arrived at Mr. Gruder's hotel room at 10 o'clock, is that correct? Yes. And what time did you leave? I can't remember. And what time did you leave, Mrs. Gellhorn? Answer the question. About three o'clock. In the morning? Yes. Not very well. Not very well. Tell me, Mrs. Scallon, how did you pass the time? A great deal of time. Five hours of time in the middle of the night in a hotel bedroom with a man you knew not very well. My Lord, I really must protest at this line of questioning. I'm merely demonstrating, my Lord, that a relationship exists between Mrs. Scallon and the previous witness which puts the evidence in an entirely new light. I'm sure that is evident to both sides. Your objection has no foundation, Miss <laughs> Lewis, and I would be obliged if you would refrain from time-wasting. Continue, please, Mr. Lotterby. Thank you, my lord. Would you like me to repeat the question, Mrs. Kelhorn? No. I, we talked. You talked for five hours. You repeated a conversation of what, three or four sentences to him? He thanked me and asked me if I'd repeat what I told him if necessary, and I said I would, and I left. And you expect the court to believe that took five hours? He was upset. In need of comfort, was he, Mrs. Kelhorn? Yes! And who better to have in his hotel bedroom than yourself? Mrs. Kelhorn, where were you on the night of November the 3rd, 1972? Oh, but of course you have a bad memory for dates. Well, I'll tell you, you were in Newcastle on Tyne, visiting friends. You stayed the night. Now, Mr. Gruder, as it happens, was watching a football match in the same city. He stayed the night. On December the 6th, the same year, you visited friends in Liverpool. You stayed the night. Mr. Gruder was watching a football match in the same city. He stayed the night. On January the... Do you wish me to continue, Mrs. Kelhorn? It isn't true. It isn't true. What isn't true, Mrs. Kelhorn? I suggest that you and Mr. Gruder have been on the most intimate terms for at least 18 months prior to his leaving Fulcher's of Rovers, and I suggest that on the night of May the 1st, you visited Mr. Gruder at his hotel, and that between you, you concocted this tissue of lies, which under oath you have told this court. And I further suggest that you did so for the two best motives known to your sex, your love for one man and your hatred for another. Mrs. Skelhorn, how would you describe your relationship with Mr. Gruder? We were friends. You had, of course, met him many times socially. Yes. Now, is there any truth in this suggestion that you were on intimate terms with Mr. Gruder? No. Or that you and he concocted this story about the visit to your ex-husband's? No. Thank you, Mrs. Gellhorn. That's all. Very well, you may leave the witness box. I call Michael Pollitson. Mr. Pollitson, you are club captain of Fulchester Rovers, are you not? Yes, that's right. How would you assess Mr. Gruder as a manager? I've always found him very fair. He works hard himself and expects everyone else to work hard. When tactically, I think he's a good manager. Uh, his briefings are always spot on, what he tells you about the other side. Were there weaknesses in that? Would you think him a man capable of telling lies to save his own skin? Possibly sending the three accused to prison by telling those lies? No, I wouldn't. I've always found him very honest. Now, Mr. Pollitson, let us turn to the three accused, Skelhorn, MacIver and Appledean. How would you assess their play during the 1972-73 season? Ropey, I'd say. They played well below par, all three of them, for most of the season. Well, except MacIver, I think he started to try again about um, end of March, beginning of April. But he was a bit desperate, and he was never at his best when he was desperate. Still, he was trying. What would you say that the three accused were well disposed towards Mr. Gruder? I'd say they ate his guts myself. They hated his guts. Why? Well, they didn't like discipline for a start. They liked clubbing it, and Mr. Gruder put the blocks on that right from the start. Oh, yeah, then, then Appledean got this um, offer of, well, quite a lot of money to write articles for the Gazette, and Mr. Gruder put a stop to that. Well, there was a clause in the contract, and uh, he made him stick to it. I see. Now, Mr. Pollison, would you tell the court where you were on the evening of January the 27th, 1973? Yeah, in the bar of the club. And was anybody else there whom you see in this court today? Yes, they were. The defendants. And they were often there, were they not? More often than not, I'd say. Yes. Now, did you hear a conversation between the defendants and anyone else? 
Yes, they were talking to George Pinnock. Uh, who is that? Oh, the captain of the opposing team. I see. And would you tell the court what it was that you heard? Yeah, well, it was like this. They came over to Pinnock and congratulated him on scoring a penalty against us. It was the winning goal, in fact. We lost the match, 1-0. They congratulated Pinnock on scoring the winning goal from a penalty. Uh, isn't this rather unusual behaviour? Yeah, it struck me like that, too, so I pricked up my ears. Well, then Pinnock said that it was more than his life was worth to have missed and that, it, and that he would have been severely disciplined by his manager. And then uh, Appledean said that he should get rid of the manager, if that was a type of little Hitler that he was, and that uh, if you knew how, it was as easy as pie. Oh, and then Skellorn said that um, if Pinnock got rid of the manager, there'd be another one going cheap. He said he should get rid of the manager, and if you knew how, it was as easy as pie. Now, Mr. Pollitson, did you get the impression that this was said in earnest, or as some kind of light-hearted repartee? Oh, no, they were serious, all right. You only had to look at their faces. Thank you. Now, as club captain, you and your wife are responsible for much of the social life of the club, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Are you aware of any relationship which exists or existed between Mr. Gruder and Mrs. Skelhorn beyond the normal relationship between a manager and the wife of one of his players? No. Thank you, Mr. Pollitson. Mr. Pollitson, how old are you? 31. Getting towards the end of the road? I've got a few years of me yet. Well, let's hope so. You enjoy being club captain? Yes. Playing first team football? Yeah. Are you aware that for some time certain elements of the board have wished to relieve you of the captaincy and to drop you from the first team altogether? Well, no. Mr. Grudo was your champion on these occasions and it was only at his insistence that you kept the captaincy and your place on the team. No, I'd uh, heard rumours. You'd heard rumours. Did you believe them? Well, Mr. Grudo always had faith in me. Yes, yes. He brought you with him from his previous club, didn't he? Yes. So he would be anxious to justify his action by continuing to play you in the first team. Well, I didn't let him down. I beg your pardon, what was that? I said I didn't let him down. Indeed you didn't, and you're not letting him down now, are you? You're showing how grateful you are, aren't you, by coming here and telling a few lies on his behalf. Lies like this conversation you pretend to have overheard between George Pinnock and the defendants. Tell me, uh, Mr. Pollitson, on the occasion of that conversation, was the bar crowded? Fairly. Fairly. Only fairly crowded after a match. Oh, come, Mr. Pollitson, it was packed, wasn't it? Well, I suppose you could say that. Yes, and yet you heard this conversation so clearly as to have almost total recall. Oh, yes, and, uh, Mr. Pollitson, haven't you ever congratulated a member of the opposing team on his play? Well, perhaps, once or twice. Yes, it's something called sportsmanship, isn't it? Fairly common occurrence, I'd have hoped. It was the of their voice, the way they said it. There was no, nothing sportsmanlike about it. Uh, Mr. Pollitson, you just said a moment ago that you could only tell the tone of the conversation by the looks on their faces. Mr. Pollison, I suggest that you have deliberately placed a sinister interpretation on a perfectly innocuous conversation. And I suggest that this is just part of your gentleman's agreement with Mr. Gruder. He helps you out in the boardroom, you help him out in the court. I have only told the truth. Come now, Mr. Pollison, you must have been a little grateful. Weren't you grateful to Mr. Gruder for standing by you so loyally? Well, yes, of course I was. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pollison. No further questions? No re-examination, my lord. Very well, then you may leave the witness box. That uh, concludes the case for the prosecution, my lord. Mr. Lotterby. Please, your lordship, I should like to call the accused in the following order. Skelhorn, MacIver, Appledean. Very well. Uh, Bernard Skelhorn, please. What is your religion? Uh, Sivi. Take the book in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is your name Bernard Skelhorn, and do you live at flat four Maple Court, Mountjoy Avenue, Fulty, sir? Yes. What do you do for a living? I'm a professional footballer. In every sense of the word? Yes. Now, you've heard all the evidence given by the prosecution witnesses in this case. If you could describe that evidence in one word, what would that word be? <laughs> well, I know the word I'd like to use, <laughs> but uh, rubbish, rubbish. Yes, well, I think we can uh, sweep it all up quite quickly. Now, Mrs. Kellogg, have you at any time entered into a conspiracy with MacIver and Appledean? No. Supposing that this conspiracy had been formed and that the alleged actions had been taken, resulting in failure and ultimate relegation, what would have been in it for you? Well, third division football instead of second. Less chance of being picked for representative games, lower standard of living. Yes, well, I don't think we need to go any further. It was hardly in your interests to act in the way alleged. <laughs> hardly. 
Now, Mr. Skelhorn, would you describe the relationship between your ex-wife and Mr. Gruder as friendly? Mm, yeah, I would. Very, very friendly. Now, to your knowledge, do they see a great deal of each other after the breakup of your marriage? Oh, yeah. Well, the lads were always telling me they'd seen him up and down the town. Mr. Skelhorn, that is hearsay. We are only interested in what you yourself saw and heard, not what other people have told you that they saw and heard. Members of the jury will disregard that remark. That was mere gossip. Could I ask you, Mr. Skelhorn, if you yourself had seen your ex-wife and Mr. Gruder together? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knocked into him in a pub in the town a couple of times. And, yes, they were at Wembley together for the cup final. And I saw them there. Thank you. Now, if I may turn to Mr. Pollitson's evidence regarding a conversation he says he'd overheard between a George Pinnock and yourself. Can you recall this conversation? No, I can't, oh. because it never happened. Why should Mr. Pollitson say that it did? No idea. Well, mind you, him and Georgie Pinnock are great mates. You know, the same school, same youth team. They've known each other for years. Oh, I see. Thank you very much, Mr. Skelhorn. No further questions. Mr. Skelhorn. I should like to read you a passage from an article by the sports editor of the Fulchester Gazette, which appeared in that paper on Monday, March the 26th, 1973. And talking of disappearing acts, what has happened to the Barney Skelhorn we all knew and loved? Last Saturday saw the latest in a long string of below-par performances and prompts this one-time admirer to ask, is Barney, at the tender age of 27, over the hill? Did you read that article, Mr. Skelhorn? Well, were you deliberately playing badly, or are you, as the article suggests, over the hill? The case of the Queen against Appledean, MacIver and Skelhorn will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court. Barney Skelhorn, Jim McIver and Peter Appledean, three of Fulchester Rovers' first team players, are jointly charged with conspiring to bring about the termination of the employment of one Alexander Gruder, a manager of Fulchester Rovers Football Club, by failing to perform their own contract with the club. It's been alleged by Alexander Gruder, Rovers' Polish-born ex-manager, that their actions resulted in relegation to the third division and his premature release by the club. His allegations have been supported by Margaret Skelhorn, ex-wife of one of the accused, who told the court of a conversation she overheard between the three players, which, if true, indicated a conspiracy between them, by Mick Pollitson, the club captain, who spoke of the enmity between the accused and the ex-manager, and by the evidence of a member of an opposing team of a further incriminating conversation involving the accused men. Barney Skelhorn, the first defence witness, is on the stand. Mr Skelhorn... Is it true you were not playing at your best during the period referred to in the newspaper article? No, I wasn't playing too good. It happens. It had been happening consistently for months. Why? Well, getting divorced and losing your kids don't help. Ah, are you telling the court that your divorce was the reason for your loss of form? Well, I was down. Them sort of things affect your game. Aren't you encouraged to take personal problems to a club official, the, the manager? <laughs> to Gruder? <laughs> well, that would have been a laugh. Well, let's get on to more serious matters, shall we? I am correct in saying, am I not, that in 1971, Fulchester Rovers was drawn against Arsenal at Highbury in the fourth round of the FA Cup. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. One of the most prestigious games to be played by the club for several years, am I right? It was important, yeah. It was very important. And you were dropped, weren't you, Mr Scalhorn? And not because you were off form, but because of a disciplinary measure. OK, so I was dropped. So what? So that, Mr Scalhorn, was when you began your hatred for Mr. Gruder, a hatred which was to lead you to say, in front of many witnesses, that you would get that bastard Gruder. A hatred which led you finally, with the help of your friends, to do just that. 
No further questions, my lord. Uh, Mr. Skellon, how many uh, professional footballers would you say have at some time in the course of their career said they would get their manager? 99% <laughs> of them. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Skellhorn. Uh, does your lordship have any questions? Very well, Mr. Skellhorn, you may go back to the dock. I call Douglas James McIver. Mr. McIver, have you ever deliberately played football badly? No, I haven't. Have you ever conspired with Skellhorn and Appledean to play football badly? No, I haven't. What did you think of Mr. Gruder? Oh, he, he was all right. A bit of a Marianne at times, but he was okay. Thank you, that's all. <sighs> Mr. Gruder was okay at all times? Aye, that's right. Was he okay during a certain nightclub incident, which Mrs. Skellhorn has referred to, the Lido in Great Hartford Street? Do you know the place? I've been in there once or twice. You were in there, were you not, one Friday night in March 1973, when a row broke out between yourself, Appledean and Skellhorn on the one hand and Mr. Gruder on the other? It was the a row. It was more of a... Well, it wasn't a row. Really? Do you recall saying to Mr. Gruder at one point, get off our backs, you bloody great Jesse? I might have done that. I, I can't remember. I'd had a few bevies. Uh, uh, Mr. McIver... I've heard of a Mary Ann and a Jesse, but bevies? A few drinks, Your Honour. Ah, I see. What would this mean, get off our backs? Well, I can't remember. Like I said, he's a bit of a Mary Ann at times. He was more than a bit of a Mary Ann to you, wasn't he? He was the man who was a threat to your swinging life. He was the man who wanted you to be in bed at 10.30 when you wanted to be out drinking. He was the man who was the disciplinarian. You were the man who hated discipline. So that when Skelhorn and Appledean suggested you join with them in bringing about his downfall, you only too readily agreed. No, that's rubbish. Fulchester Gazette, January the 29th, 1973. I quote. And then, as Rovers appeared to be coasting home with an undeserved point, came McIver's brainstorm. For no apparent reason, and under the eyes of an astonished referee and a disbelieving crowd, the chunky Scot chopped down Hamilton a good two yards inside the box. Do you remember that article? Aye. Well, it quotes accurately, does it not, what happened? There was a penalty, aye. The rest, slander. Ah, defamatory, is it? Did you sue for slander or complain to the newspapers at all? Well, no. No. No, indeed. I suggest to you, Mr. McIver, that the reason for your giving away that penalty has become startlingly obvious. I don't know what you're talking about. I call Peter Appledean. Mr. Appledean, have you at any time conspired with any person or persons to commit acts which would affect adversely the career of Alexander Gruder? Never. Can you offer any explanation as to why Mr. Gruder should accuse you of such a conspiracy? Yes, I can. Mr. Gruder was a little man, a petty dictator, a fascist. He liked making rules, but he didn't much care whether they were good or bad. And like all little men, when things began to go wrong, he began to squeal like a stuck pig. You make no secret of your dislike for Mr. Gruder. No, I never have. I dislike any man who clings to a job he can't do. And Gruder was no more a manager than I'm a, a prime minister. He couldn't handle men. He never had any dues. They were always... Don't. And how did this attitude lead to his accusation? Well, first of all, it led to our being relegated, and that had been on the cards from the beginning of the season. Gruder was a, an Alf Ramsey man. He, he didn't believe in wingers. Well, that's what I was. I was fast. I could, uh, I could beat a back, cross from the byline, Jim McIver, knock him in. Well, I thought that was what I'd been bought for. But it wasn't the way Mr. Gruder used me. No, he had me fetching and carrying, wandering about all over the park. I think he saw me as the Martin Peters of Fulchester Rovers. From all accounts, you didn't fill the role very successfully. It's been suggested you didn't play well for much of the season. I admit it, I didn't play well. I didn't like what I was being asked to do. It was bound to affect my game. I wasn't the only one. The whole team played badly. You're bound to when you've got a manager who doesn't know what he's doing. And this, you submit, led to relegation? Yes. Yes, I do. I, I think with a, another manager, we'd have had a very good chance of... Staying up. Were you surprised to hear that Mr. Gruder's contract had not been renewed? No. Nope. Were you pleased to hear it? Yes, I was. I thought it was the best thing that could have happened to the club. One more point. 
How difficult is it to deliberately to play football badly? Well, it's easy if you're a bad footballer. No, but if you're a good footballer, it's, it's practically impossible, particularly when you've got a, a 20,000 crowd strong looking at you. Well, and a full press box as well. Thank you. No more questions, my lord. Mr. Appledean, you told my learned friend that Mr. Gruder was no more a manager than you were a prime minister. Did you mean this as a compliment? I think you'd better explain that. Oh, dear, I was hoping for an explanation from you, but if you insist. What I mean, Mr. Appledean, is that you do indeed see yourself as a prime minister. Prime minister of an anarchist state, if there is such a contradiction in terms, but a political leader nonetheless. You are a political animal, are you not? We all are. I had hoped for practical fact rather than dogma. Still, when you were at university, Mr. Appledean, were you the secretary and leading light of a student anarchist organisation? I was a lot of things at university. Answer the question. I was secretary of a political group, yes, but um, we weren't anarchists, we were socialists. I imagine most socialists would have disowned you. I imagine we'd have disowned most socialists. I'm sure you would. You disliked establishment in any form, did you not? I distrusted it. I, I distrust any group that tries to cement itself into power. And you consider it your duty to break up that cement? Yes. And there are millions like me. Now, be careful, Mr. Appledean. There may well be millions who entertain a vague dislike of the establishment, but there are very few who consider it their duty to do something about it. You are one of those few. You are prepared to take active steps, are you not? Well, now, look, if you mean by that that I took active steps against Gruder, then I you're wrong. I was not mentioning Mr. Gruder. But, since you've introduced him, did you see Mr. Gruder as an establishment figure? A little one. A little one, maybe, but an establishment figure nonetheless. And what's more, and this really damned him in your eyes, a man who'd sold his enlightened birthright to embrace the materialistic lifestyle of the decadent West. Oh, this is not the McCarthy Tribunal. Mr. Lotterby, I am no more anxious than you to partake in the witch hunt. However, the unfortunate fact is the political motivation of every shade is demanding more and more of the court's time. And I cannot rule out the possibility that such a motivation might apply to this case. Nor will I rule that such questioning is necessarily inappropriate. And I think, um, actually, this is a very good time to adjourn for lunch. Court will rise. Mr. Appledean, you have told this court that you consider it your duty to destroy the establishment in all its forms and that you considered Mr. Gruder a member of that establishment. Is that correct? No. No, I said that I distrusted the establishment in all its forms, but some of it, all right, most of it needs destroying, yeah. And Mr. Gruder, did he need to be destroyed? Yes. So you set about destroying him? I set about thinking of it, but before I could get an answer, he destroyed himself. You were not concerned with his destruction? I was concerned with it, but not in it. Nobody could have... Certainly not me. We could have destroyed him. No footballer can play badly on purpose for so long and get away with it. But you haven't got away with it yet, have you, Mr. Appledean? Let us look for a while at what footballers can and cannot do. Now, what you are telling this court, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that a professional footballer plays by instinct and that that instinct makes it impossible for him to lower his game. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You, you don't have time. The game's too fast nowadays. Anybody who could do that would well, have to be very clever. Um, to do it over most of a season, I'd have to be a miracle worker. Really, Mr. Appledean? Well, I've watched a good deal of so-called first-class football. And if you're right, then I've seen many clever men. So who knows, there may be one or two miracle workers too. How do you explain, for instance, the team who, leading 1-0 with five minutes to go, finds it apparently impossible to move at anything other than a snail's pace, or to kick the ball more than two yards back to the point of a free kick, or indeed to let the ball leave their hands from a throw-in? But reverse the score and have them losing 1-0, and what happens? Everyone is galvanised into action, the ball sent unerringly back to where it's wanted, throws taken like lightning. 
Now, this may seem to be collective, but in fact, it is individual. How would you describe the player who lies apparently dead in the middle of the pitch one second and the next is grimly defending his own goal at the other end? Or the attacker who trips headlong over a blade of grass in the penalty area the minute a defender approaches him? Or are you saying that these all form parts of professional football as you are taught to play it? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. But well, you're bound to get the odd clown. And these are the blokes you've been talking about, the clowns. Oh, come now, Mr. Appledean, these are not the clowns. These are the quick thinkers, by your own definition, the miracle men. And there are more of them than you're prepared to admit. You are one yourself. So is Skelhorn, so is MacIver. But you were clever. You planned it. The conspiracy was your idea, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I believe in cutting my own throat. Look, it pays to win, you but know. But you were winning, Mr. Appledean. The club was losing, but not you. Now, I don't know how you persuaded Skelhorn and MacIver that it was worth losing all those winning bonuses, worth going down to the third division, but you needed no such persuasion, did you? Because you weren't going with them. Where were you on the afternoon of Sunday, this September the 10th, 1973? I have no idea. Really? Well, then I'll tell you. You were lunching in a hotel in Birmingham with the chairman of a well-known London First Division club. A highly irregular approach was made to you and you showed your interest. Now do you remember? It must have been someone else. It wasn't me. Thank you. No more questions. Uh, no re-examination, Lord. Very well. You may go back to the dock. I call Brian Roderick Martindale. Brian Roderick Martindale, please. Please keep the prisoner You tell the court your name and address, please. Brian Roderick Martindale. I live at Magnolia Lodge, Little Helston. You're a textile manufacturer by trade and by hobby, a director and chairman of Fultis of Rovers, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Did you attend all of your club's matches last season? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I normally miss two or three for business reasons, but last season, happily, I was able to get to every match. Mr Martindale, would it be possible, in your opinion, for professional footballers to throw matches without it being obvious? From what I know of football, it would be quite impossible for any player to do that without it being patently obvious. Did it occur to you while watching Fultis of Rovers play that uh, the three accused were deliberately playing badly or... Or throwing matches? No, it certainly did not. Have you ever rowed with Mr. Gruder? No. We've had differences of opinion, but we've never rowed. Thank you. No further questions? Did you see eye to eye with Mr. Gruder on football matters, particularly those pertaining to Fulchester Rovers? No, I'm afraid not. I was sort of rather hidebound in his approach to the game. Rovers needed a different style of play, and to be honest, I don't think it was within Mr. Gruder's nature to provide it. What was your reaction to the allegations made by Mr. Gruder that he'd been let down by three of his team? <laughs> well, I wasn't surprised. Uh, to my mind, Mr. Gruder typifies the sort of man who can't bear to have his ability questioned. <coughs> point of phrase, uh, the sort of man who would clutch at any straw to save himself from drowning in the sea of his own inadequacy. A most graphic phrase, Mr. Martindale. Thank you. Mr. Martindale, yourself and Mr. Gruder disagreed, I understand, over the transfer of Skelhorn in 1970 and Appledean in 72. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. How did you disagree? Violently? Strongly. You rowed? No. We disagreed. He put forward one set of arguments and I put forward another. And you won? Yes, I won. And you preferred that it should be you? Well, naturally. There really wasn't room for both of you in the same football club, was there? Are you suggesting I will tell I... you what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting you were shrewd enough to realise that events were taking a very satisfactory path. I'm suggesting you had no knowledge of this conspiracy as such, but I am further suggesting that you innocently contributed to the success of that conspiracy by instigating the removal of Mr Gruder at that time, which was something you had always wanted. What do you have to say to that? I have to say that certain parts of your statement are unfounded and that I have told the truth as I know it. Mr. Martindale, what would you say if I were to tell you that some time ago one of your first team players met the chairman of a London First Division club in secret and discussed the possibility of a transfer? <laughs> I should have the greatest difficulty in believing you. Have you been approached by any London First Division club for one of your players? 
It's not normal for us to discuss such matters. Uh, negotiations might be affected. This is not a press conference. This is a court of law. Answer the question. Yes, we have been approached. By a London First Division club? Yes. And the name of the player? Peter Appledean. Peter Appledean. Thank you very much. No further questions. Uh, Mr. Martindale, even if we may uh, jeopardise your negotiations, I must ask you uh, two or three more questions. When were you first approached about uh, Appledean? Oh, February 73. It was a very tentative inquiry. February, and it's alleged that the three accused uh, put their plans into operation sometime early in the season. It would appear, therefore, that this approach was made sometime after the conspiracy alleged had begun. It would appear so, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the board's answer to this inquiry? Oh, we told them we weren't interested. There was no shortage of money, happily, and we wanted to get into the first division. We needed good players like Peter Appledean to help us get there. And has that view changed? If anything, it's hardened. We're now in the third division. We need good players even more desperately. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martindale. You may leave the box. Thank you. <coughs> that concludes the case for the defence, my lord. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, one fact which has emerged from this trial is that the three accused all actively disliked Alexander Gruder and were delighted when he was relieved of his position as manager of Fulchester Rovers. Skelhorn had a grudge after being dropped from an important game McIver objected to the discipline which curtailed his swinging life, and Appledean, a self-confessed anarchist, whilst making plans to have himself changed to another team, revelled in the prospect of destroying an establishment figure. It's important, members of the jury, to bear this in mind when considering what would normally be highly improbable, namely that professional footballers should deliberately play badly. And play badly they did, but why? Remember Mrs. Skelhorn's evidence when she overheard the agreement, wouldn't it be a good idea if Jim upended one of their players in the box? Remember the newspaper report, MacIver's brainstorm, a good two yards inside the box, a report which the man did not feel the need to contradict. Remember the evidence of Michael Pollitson, the club captain, when he heard the accused tell the captain of an opposing team that it was as easy as pie to get rid of a manager if you knew how. Ladies and gentlemen, beyond any shadow of a doubt, these add up to a premeditated conspiracy between these three men to end Mr. Gruder's chosen career. And their reasons? Pure malice and total immaturity. Their actions were in defiance of the good faith they owed their club and in defiance of the law. And I ask you to find them guilty as charged. Thank you, Miss Lewis. <coughs> Lord, uh, my Lord, uh, members of the jury, it seems that uh, during the last football season, my clients did not play consistently well. Be that as it may, that is not an offence. The prosecution has attempted to give a sinister explanation of simple lack of form. Well, let's look at the prosecution's evidence, shall we? Uh, firstly, the testimony of Alexander Gruder. Now, here is a man, a bitter, disappointed man, desperately trying to get back into the game at the expense of these three men. And secondly, uh, Mrs. Skelhorn, who, although denying intimacy with Gruder, can spend five hours in his bedroom late at night relating a five-minute conversation. And thirdly, Mr. Pollitson's vague story of how he overheard a conversation between, in a crowded bar room between uh, the accused and a certain George Pinnock. Well, a story we might take a little more seriously if it was uh, not patently obvious that Mr. Pollitson was very much in Mr. Gruder's debt for keeping him on as captain of the team. Well, that's the prosecution's evidence, and it's simply not good enough. And it becomes absurd if you consider the suggestion that three professional footballers should try and cut their own throats by ruining their team. And the fact that the trained eye of Mr. Martindale, who watched every match last season, failed to detect any sign whatsoever of deliberate bad play. Our members of the jury, I suggest that you have no alternative but to find the accused not guilty. Members of the jury, the three accused are charged with conspiring together to terminate the employment of Mr. Alexandra Gruder as manager of Fulchester Rovers Football Club by deliberately playing badly. Now, a conspiracy is an agreement between two or more persons, and an agreement of the nature alleged is a crime. 
Now, you must ask yourselves if the evidence that you have heard establishes beyond reasonable doubt that, in fact, such an agreement did exist. Now, some of the evidence bears on the joint action of the accused and much pertains to their individual actions. Now, you're concerned with the evidence of their individual actions because it bears on an agreement which, if indeed it did exist, must logically involve more than one person. Therefore, although you must return three separate verdicts, you cannot find one of the accused guilty without finding at least one of the other two guilty as well. Now, members of the jury, will you kindly retire to consider your verdict? All stand. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached verdicts upon which you are all agreed? Yes. Do you find the accused Bernard Kelhorn guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? Yes. Do you find the accused James McIver guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? Yes. Do you find the accused Peter Appledean guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? Yes. Mr. Justice Campbell sentenced the three footballers to 18 months imprisonment. The player's future now lies with the Football Association Commission, which is specially appointed to investigate this case. The players may face a lifelong suspension from the game. Alexander Gruder will not be rejoining Fulchester Rovers, but has applied for a manager's job in the south of England. <laughs>